Hello everyone and welcome back to Medzomedic, a channel that is only about medicine half the time. My name is Kitty and I'm an academic junior doctor working in the UK and today we're going to talk about how to do an audit or QI project as a medical student. Audits tend to be easier to get involved with than research because they generally take less time, the methodology doesn't need to be as robust and supervisors are less picky. In this video, I'm going to talk about what is an audit or QI project, how to maximise the points that you get from it, identifying an audit topic, the stages of an audit cycle, and finally, ways to present your audit results and channels for collaborative audits. So first of all, what is an audit or quality improvement project? Audits are different to research in that you're not testing a brand new hypothesis, but rather you're measuring current practice against a standard that is already backed up by evidence. If this standard is not met in your trust, changes can then be implemented to then bring the standard up to the national level, hence quality improvement. Audits and QI projects are also particularly important to a process we call clinical governance. This essentially refers to a framework that holds the organisation, so the hospital trust, and the individual, so working clinicians, accountable for continually improving the services that are provided and safeguarding against a high standard of practice. This is a key concept that will often come up in clinical interviews in the future when you are applying for a postgraduate post, and demonstrating your understanding of an audit or quality improvement process will place you in very good stead. Let's take a look at the core surgical training checklist in order to gain an idea of what you need to do to get maximum points for an audit. Looking at this table from the 2020 portfolio guidance, you can see that just doing the QI project or clinical audit alone will only score you 5 points out of a maximum of 11. In order to score more points, you will have to present the results at your local trust and re-audit the data. To score maximum points, aside from leading your QI project or your clinical audit, you will have to present the re-audited results at a regional or national meeting. Note that if you do manage to present your audit, you'll also score points for the presentation section and likewise for publications. But this might be quite hard to do unless your audit involves very large cohorts or contains a novel technique in doing it. So how do you go about identifying an audit topic? I would say the easiest thing to do is speak to a consultant of his specialty and ask if they have any ideas in mind about topics that can be audited. The reason for this is because they will have a much better understanding of what the department's needs are and what previous audits have already been done. It is generally also in the department and the hospital's interest as well to get good audits done in order to secure funding. When you pick a topic, make sure that what you're doing is an audit, i.e. you're collecting data and checking it against a national practice that is already in place, rather than collecting data for something entirely novel, which would be more akin to a research project rather than an audit. If you don't have any luck identifying an audit topic from a particular department, you can always go on the NICE CKS guidelines and look for something that you're interested in and propose an idea to a consultant. In some of the NICE documents, you'll also find that they actually propose some ideas of audits that you can carry out in your local trust. Remember that the key to doing audits is that you need to implement a change. So when you are picking a topic, think about what things you can do to improve this practice if it comes short of the national average. For example, making a new clerking performer or writing a new set of guidelines for the trust. Some examples of common audits that people do include VTE prophylaxis and emissions, prescribing antihypertensives in primary care, and evaluating whether Parkinson's meds, for example, are given on time in a geriatrics ward. So now let's talk about the audit cycle and the practical steps you need to take to complete an audit. This means identifying the topic, which we've already talked about, registering the audit locally, data collection and analysis, reporting your audit results and identifying potential barriers to improving practice, implementing a change, and re-auditing the data. So let's go through these step by step. In terms of registering your audit, almost all hospitals and trusts will require you to do this so that they can keep track of what is occurring every year. This department will also be in charge of tracing up the results of your project so that they know what changes have been made for the trust, again as I said because it is important for funding. If your audit requires uploading data to an external database to capture data, you might also need approval from somebody called the Caldecott Guardian, which is the person in charge of data governance for the trust. In terms of data collection and analysis, the initial audit should be a snapshot of the current practice. Depending on what you're auditing and the number of patients that you can look at at one particular time, this might be auditing patients who are in hospital for a few days or up to a few months. Audit data collection can be prospective or retrospective depending on the goals of your project and generally involves looking in the patient's notes for any data that you need. Or if you're working in GP, you can use the GP database on EMIS, for example, to search for a particular keyword that brings up any patient with a particular condition or particular outcome in a certain time frame. 
The best way to do that is to ask the practice manager or the IT person to teach you a bit about the coding that they use and how you can use this to your advantage. After you've gathered the initial data set, you want to answer the question of whether the standard of practice that you were comparing to was actually met. If not, what are the potential barriers from stopping this goal from being met? For example, were all the patients who came into hospital via admissions accurately assessed for VTE prophylaxis? If not, why is this the case? Is it because people are not aware that they need to do this? Is it because people aren't sure what the guidelines are in terms of VTE prophylaxis? Based on this conclusion, you then implement a potential change to improve practice. So in our VTE example, it would be potentially changing the clerking performer so that it automatically lists out all the guidelines for VTE prophylaxis and prompts the clerking doctor to fill it out. So you've addressed the potential barriers and you can put it in action by, say, contacting the hospital and printing new clerking performers to be used. Or as another example, if you find that Parkinson's patients weren't receiving their medications at the right time, you could do an intervention as simple as printing out stickers to put on patients' drug charts to remind the nursing staff that this person has Parkinson's and they will need their medication at a certain time of day. So after you have implemented the change and some time has passed, now you want to re-audit your data, which means going back and doing the exact same data collection process you did the first time around. You then want to compare the data from before and after your intervention to see if this is actually improved practice practice or not. And that's it, you have now completed one audit cycle. Now for many audits, they'll actually go on for several cycles, either because there is further room for improvement or the standard is still not met. In this case, it's the same process all over again, so you identify another potential intervention that you can do to improve practice, do that, and re-audit the data again, find another area that you can improve, do that, and then re-audit the data again. For example, if the stickers and the drug trials are not enough to improve the practice on giving Parkinson's medications on time, you might organise an educational session for all staff on the ward and see if this then change any practice. In terms of presenting your audit, there are a couple options for this. The first of this is a departmental meeting or a GP governance meeting. This is usually a guarantee for most audit and QI projects as long as you have a supportive consultant who approved of the idea in the first place. Most departments and GP practices are very interested in what you found and ways to implement change and improve practice. You can also look to present your results in a more trust-wide setting including mortality and morbidity meetings, grand rounds, and governance meetings. Moving beyond your local trust, you can also look to present at a regional quality improvement conference. Most training regions in the UK will have a quality improvement service of some kind that invites trainees and allied health professionals to present their projects. For example, in Bristol we have the Southwest QI conference which is run annually and invites anyone from medical students to trainees to consultants to nurses to HCAs to present their projects. If your order is particularly novel or has provided significant changes in service provision, it is very possible to even present it at a national conference. For example, Bristol has been very proactive in promoting the Think Aorta campaign, which looks at missed diagnosis of aortic dissection presenting to emergency departments in the UK. They then incorporated multiple ways of improving staff education and identifying aortic dissection on presentation, which has garnered a lot of national attention. Finally, I want to talk about the role of research collaboratives in providing national audits. Research collaborative groups in the UK sometimes offer the opportunity for medical students to get involved in nationwide audit projects. Star Search, for example, runs a national or international audit every year where medical students can participate as a data collector or in more higher leadership positions to gain an idea of how an audit works. The benefits of participating in a national audit is that you get a really good idea of how a large, well-structured audit is run in a national capacity. You usually also get to present the results back to your local department and the final results are much more significant and tend to get published because it involves a very large patient cohort that is otherwise very hard to do by yourself. However, the downsides are that they usually count for less points on your CV because you haven't led it from start to end. There's also less capacity for you to present the results beyond a local setting because this is usually given to someone higher up in the organisation committee. Implementing changes in a national level can also be very hard to organise, so this might have to be something that you carry out in your own time after the national audit has occurred. So that wraps up this video. I hope this was useful in terms of demonstrating what an audit or QI project is and how you can get involved as a medical student. Leave your questions in the comments section below and I'll try to get back to that as quickly as I can. If you're interested in how you can build other elements of your medical CV, you can always check out this playlist of medical CV building for medical students. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.